The Haunted Spy. Written and illustrated by Barbara Nint Byfield. I am a spy who got tired of spying. I was tired of having to wear my trench coat even when it wasn't raining. I was tired of living in hotels, driving fast cars, and eating meals I never had time to finish. One day, I tried to write a note with my walkie-talkie disguised as a fountain pen. Then I tried to see the time on my tape recorder disguised as a wristwatch. Then I pinched my finger in the false bottom of my attaché case. Really, I said to myself, I'm getting too old for this secret agent business. I think I shall retire to a quiet life in the country. So I went off in my fast car looking for a house to retire to. The seventh house I looked at had all the things I wanted. It was built on an island in a small lake. There was a smaller island nearby with a ruin on it. And there was a boat for getting from one island to the other. And best of all, the house had a very fine tower. In fact, it wasn't a house at all. It was a small castle. I can be happy and comfortable here, I said to myself. And so I came to live in the castle. I packed away the walkie-talkie, the tape recorder, the attaché case, and the trench coat. I traded my fast car for an old station wagon and my gun for a fishing rod. And with my dog, Zero, I came to live in the castle. At first, there was a lot to do. I had to nail down all the loose floorboards. I had to sweep out lots of cobwebs and clean the chimney so the fireplace wouldn't smoke. I also oiled and wound the grandfather clock in the hall and polished up the suit of armor on the landing. But soon the castle was just as I wanted it, which is to say warm and comfortable with the best of old and new. The summer days were long, and I had time to do all the things I had never had time for when I was spying. I grew some tomatoes and asparagus in the garden. I fished in the lake, and when it was very hot, I dozed in my hammock. One day, Zero, the dog, and I rode over to the small island to see the ruin. The tumbled-down building was covered with ivy, and Zero started howling as soon as we got close to it. In fact, he didn't stop howling until we were back in the boat and on our way home. I wondered what made him so nervous. Perhaps the ruin was a tomb. <laughs> then autumn came, and one stormy night, as I was lighting the fire and getting ready to roast some chestnuts, I suddenly had the feeling that I was being watched. Zero growled and I spun around. But the door was closed, the windows empty, and there was nowhere in the room for anyone to hide. I had just decided that I was imagining things when I noticed my book. It had been closed, I was sure of it, and now it lay open. I searched the whole castle room by room, but found nothing. And from then on, every night, something strange happened. Once, my chair overturned. Then all the paintings turned their faces to the wall. Rugs rolled themselves up. I found my bedroom slippers in the kitchen sink, and I always felt I was being watched. And finally, one night I heard footsteps upstairs in the tower. I jumped up and threw down my book. I might as well have kept on spying for all the peace and quiet I get in this house. I'll just have to do this one more job and find out what is going on. So I unpacked my trench coat, put on my tape recorder wristwatch, and my rubber-soled shoes. 
and I put my walkie-talkie pen in my pocket. Now I felt ready for business. When I reached the tower room, however, the footsteps stopped. There was nothing there, not even a footprint in the thick dust. Just then, a sound of water pouring into the bathtub came from below. I raced down the stairs to the bathroom, but the tub was empty and as dry as a bone. At that moment, the grandfather clock started striking the hour. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Zero had been growling softly all this time, but as soon as the clock stopped, he started wagging his tail, and for the rest of the night, everything was quiet. The next night, I decided to hide and watch for the intruder, so Zero and I climbed into the grandfather clock, leaving the door open a crack. It was very stuffy and smelled of mice, but I had a good view of the hall and stairs. Soon I heard the footsteps coming slowly down the stairs from the tower. They had just passed the landing when the mousy smell and the dust got the better of me. <laughs> I sneezed. The footsteps stopped, and for the rest of the night, there wasn't a sound. The second night, I decided to hide in the suit of armor on the landing. Sure enough, the sound of footsteps began again in the tower room and came down the winding stairs towards me. I was just about to see who it was when, clang, the visor of the helmet fell shut. And again, there were no more sounds for the rest of the night. By the third night, I was very cross and tired, but I decided to hide once more, this time in the tower room itself. It was not until the coldest hour, just before dawn, that Zero growled and I heard footsteps. A sound was coming from directly beneath us. Quickly, I knelt with my ear to the floor, and sure enough, I heard the clanking steps fading away below me. I yanked up a couple of floorboards, and there, built into the thickness of the wall, was a narrow stone stairway. Flashlight in hand, I lowered myself onto the first step and began the cramped and winding downward climb, Zero growling and protesting behind me. Soon the stairway stopped winding and I found myself in a low tunnel, which rapidly became so small that I had to crawl on all fours. I could still hear the footsteps very faintly ahead of me. And then, suddenly, my flashlight went out. There I was on all fours in a wet, dark tunnel, and for the first time, I was really afraid. How I wished there were someone at the other end of my walkie-talkie instead of a shivering, growling dog at my heels. I couldn't turn around, as the tunnel was too narrow, so we kept on for what seemed like miles and miles, with no light and the water dripping on us from all sides. I suddenly felt sure that the tunnel must lead under the lake to the other island. And so it did, for we suddenly came up and found ourselves inside the ruin. And there, in the faint cold light, I could see a large stone coffin with the figure of a knight in armor lying on the lid. As I stared, Zero gave a terrifying yelp, and the figure rose up before us. A chill voice spoke from the gaping helmet. I have been waiting for you, I gulped. 
for me? Never in all my years of spying had I been more frightened. Yes, for you. Many nights have I come for you to lead you here, where I am, master. I glanced wildly about me, but the door to the tunnel had closed itself and there was no escape. Who are you? I finally stammered. I am Sir Roger de Rudecil. I built this castle, the voice replied crossly. It is a very nice castle, I said, hoping to sound friendly. Silence, roared Sir Roger. You shall do as I command and listen to my tale. It is a long one, and there is work for you to do when it is ended. Once I, like you, wished for a quiet life, he continued. I too was an agent and a spy for my king, and I too wearied of it. I wearied of the heavy armor, the hard riding, the interrupted banquets, the wearing of poison rings, the documents hidden in the hollow handle of my lance. So I came to the island with my modest treasure and began to build. Alas, before the work could be completed, I had the misfortune to fall from the tower. And so I died. I am terribly sorry, I murmured politely. So am I, replied the knight. I was buried here, he continued. As you can see, and as tombs go, it is not a bad one. I quite like the lapping of the water and the croaking of the frogs on summer nights, but I cannot rest until my castle is completed. You shall do it for me. Is there much to do? I asked with a sinking heart and the thought of building more walls and towers. Very little, he replied, for I never meant for it to be a large place. Small, but perfect. All the important work is done. The great hall, a very fine tower, a secret stairway, and one of the finest of small dungeons, if I might say so. Yes, indeed, I agreed. A splendid dungeon. But can you tell me what there is left to do? I find it most comfortable. Dunce! exclaimed the knight. There is no drawbridge, there is no parapet, there are no partisans from which to spy the advancing foe, there is no postern gate. I have lain awake for centuries awaiting the man who could complete my castle. I have haunted away the other inhabitants who were not the right sort, but I think you and I will get on quite well. You shall finish off the few details for me. It will not be difficult, for I shall tell you exactly how I wish the work to be done. The last of my treasure is buried in the dungeon, and there should be enough to pay for everything, if you are clever and careful. And now, you may go. The tunnel door opened by itself, and Zero and I crawled back to the castle. The next day, following Sir Roger's directions, I found his chest of gold coins buried deep in the dungeon. Among the coins were souvenirs of his career, a hollow spur, a dagger with a code engraved on the blade, and the poison ring. And so I called the builders, and the work began. Every night, Sir Roger de Rudecil came clanking over to inspect the previous day's work. If there was something not to his liking, he would wake me and have me make a note of it. He was rather impatient, and the fault had to be corrected the very next day. The new bartizans and parapets were soon finished, as were the postern gate and drawbridge. I found the castle much improved, and I even had enough gold left to build a modest barbican on the mainland. Sir Roger was very pleased, although it had not been part of his original plan, and I used it as a garage for my station wagon. I put Sir Roger's hollow spur, his dagger, and his poison ring on the mantelpiece, along with my walkie-talkie, tape recorder, and other souvenirs. 
Now, he sometimes comes clanking through the tunnel, up the secret stairs, and down the main staircase to the great hall, and we sit in front of the fire and exchange stories of our adventures and of all the dangers we each went through. We are both content, although Zero still growls when he hears the footsteps on the stairs. Hello, I hope you enjoyed this book today. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing. Feel free to check out some of my other videos. Thank you.